content and all that. It was so fun. Awesome. That's great. <laughs> Where are you, by the way? Are you in New York? Are you in another city? No, I live in Boston. You're in Boston. You're in Boston. Boston. Oh, in not, too far, not too far away. 15 years. Where do you live? I live in New Haven. Yeah. I mean, oh, you're not that far. Yeah, we moved from New York. I mean, we're in New York a fair amount still, but um, I'm a, like a lifelong New Yorker, so this is an experiment. But oh, I like wow. it. I like it. It's I miss a city, like a big city, but I um, it's nice. I mean, I've been able to come up to Boston and visit more than I would otherwise. Um, so, yeah. Well, next time you are in the area, let me know. I know. Well, definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. We have some people in here already. Um, we're going to give everyone maybe like three, four minutes to join us. I know it's like around dinner time. So give people a few minutes. Sounds good. Did your boys start school? They did. Week? They started last, God, when did they started last week. So we're in week two. So there's some tears because now it's real. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My six-year-old said, why is it the law that children must go to have to go to school? That's a smart kid. <laughs> you know, you're right. It's a real question. I think it's suddenly real to him that this is 12 years, you know, of his life. Well, I don't know about the 12 years being real, but this is real that it's now like a thing. Yeah. Yeah. How old are they? They are um, just turned six and just turned four. Oh my God. They're such nuggets. I see them on Instagram all the time. Oh, so cute. Oh, they're, really cute. <laughs> they're really cute. They're really, they're really great. Their characters, they may come disrupt us. I'm just warning you, it's their bedtime. So they don't always do well with the idea that I'm not available around bedtime. So we'll, we'll no see. worries. The more the merrier. If they join, they join. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay. We have some people coming in. Awesome. Welcome. We'll get started in just a few minutes. This is mm. so nice. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is actually our second Meet the Author event. The first one was with, I, I don't know if you know her, Susanna Kahalen. Yeah, I loved her book. Yeah, yeah. So we did it with her and it was so fun. And I was like, actually, Michael Devlin, who is here, he's a part of the foundation. Uh -huh. he, he emailed me like several months ago and he's like, there is a book that I need you to read. And I was like, oh. okay. <laughs> and it was your book. Oh and, and I read it and I was like, oh my gosh, how do we get in touch with her? So here we are a few months later. <laughs> I love it. This is great. Yes. Yeah, her book is amazing. I mean, I read it when I was still trying to figure out what was going on with me. And it's such a dramatic story. It's almost like the inverse of mine because it's fast and sudden, right? Um, totally. Yeah. I read her book. Well, I should say I listened to her book because my illness started with severe vision loss. So it was the first audible I had ever gotten. And I listened to it the week after I got diagnosed, oh. finished it in two days. And that's, it was one of the, uh, the things that gave me this idea that I should start a foundation. So she changed my life in, in more ways than she knows. <laughs> that's amazing and you too so we're going to talk about that now I guess you know what we'll, let's get started when people okay. are being recorded so people can always watch it from the beginning if they want to let me take a sip of my drink it's non-alcoholic it's soda water <laughs> <laughs> same one I think pretty much the same exactly we're cut from the same cloth Megan <laughs> All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to the Samira Foundation's Meet the Author event. My name is Samira and I am the founder and executive director of the Samira Foundation. I have been living with seronegative neuromyelitis optica since 2014. Today, I am honored to introduce you all to Megan O'Rourke, celebrated writer, poet, and critic. Her newest book, The Invisible Kingdom, Reimagining Chronic Illness, which recently became a New York Times bestseller, takes a deep dive into the elusive category of chronic illness and autoimmune disease, inspired by and interlaced with stories from Megan's personal experiences. 
Before I introduce you all to our special guest, just a few housekeeping items to address. The first is that this event is being recorded and will be available for replay on TSF's YouTube and Facebook video library. So don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And there will be a dedicated live Q&A towards the second half of our time together. So please don't be shy, populate your questions in the chat function for Megan, and I'm sure she'd love to answer them. So without further ado, it is my pleasure and joy to introduce you all to Megan O'Rourke. Thank you for being here, Megan. Thanks so much for having me. It's a total pleasure to be here tonight. Oh, it's the the joy is really, really mine. I got to tell you. So as I was saying to you earlier, someone brought your book to my attention. He's actually in the audience. Hello, Michael. And I read it so quickly. And then two or three weeks later, you and I were on a panel together. Do you oh, remember that? I do remember. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then I started talking to our team and I was like, guys, let's talk to her. Let's see if she wants to do something with us. So thank you for trusting us and being here. Oh, it's totally my pleasure. I loved that panel we were on together because, you know, it's funny. I have a, obviously have been sick for a long time. Um, I wrote this book, I've shared my story and yet I haven't really had like pals or friends to talk to, you know, so it's really different sitting alone at your desk and writing about this from being on a panel talking to other people who just immediately understand. And that was the first moment where I was thought, oh, this isn't just a vulnerable thing of coming out and telling my story. It's actually this moment of connection and finding people who I have a kind of shorthand with. So I immediately felt a connection to you and your work, Samira. Oh, yeah. thank you. I have to say, I, I was reading this book and your personal stories and even the way you write, Megan, I mean, you're, you're such a gifted writer, but the, the way you wrote about your experiences with such great detail and vulnerability, it was so incredibly relatable. I mean, we don't have the same diagnosis, but so much of what you went through on your journey to a diagnosis, like I felt at times I was reading parts of my own story and I'm sure others around the world who have now read this, who suffer from chronic illness, likely share the same sentiment. So there, you must feel some, or I hope you feel some sense of pride that you've created this thing that brings people together. It's a, it's a symbol of solidarity. Oh, that's really nice of you to say. I um, It was my hope that the book could be that for some readers. Um, I think as any of you here who know what it's like to live with chronic illness uh, might understand, you're not, I wasn't sure that that would be the case, right? And, and I think so many of us have experienced the um, moment of trying to tell our stories to someone who don't know if you've ever gotten this, but the quick blink and then turn to a totally different subject. Oh yeah, <laughs> like <within>. oh yeah. <laughs> right, and so, you know, from, from well-meaning family members, from my, you know, whatever, from people close to me. Yeah. For whom it's hard to listen in person. And so I had no idea would the book just be like that? Would I put the story out and would people basically be like, well, whatever, another, you know, sick person telling a boring story. So it was, it was, it definitely felt a little scary actually to do. So it has been really incredible to see that although so many of us have different stories, there are these constants and that actually by coming together and talking about it, I really, really do believe this. I know it sounds hokey, but I think there's incredible power in visibility and coming together. And that's the idea of the title of the book. Like, let's take this invisible kingdom and remind ourselves of the kingdom and the power in the, the many. Yeah. Oh, it's brilliant. And I actually love the title so much because, you know, you didn't even have to explicitly explain it as a reader. I understood exactly what you were envisioning. And yeah. it, even just like with rare diseases. So there, there are 7,000 rare diseases, which means that rare disease is not so rare, but right. it's rarely ever talked about. But the right. way you framed your story and all the anecdotes and the evidence-based research and your own personal experiences, like I see what you did there with this, yeah. this empire that you created. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Also, I mean, I'm sure you feel this way with the foundation, but I really, the title was the last, the very last part to come together. I had a different title, but it was incredibly hard to find a title because I wanted it to, to gesture to 
the challenges, right? And the challenge mm-hmm. that so many of us experience is that invisibility, that sense that sometimes our conditions can't be seen physically on us or they're rare, so they're not seen in that sense. But I didn't want the title to be, I wanted there to be some like sparkle in the title too, right? Some sense of possibility and beauty. And so I don't know, somehow, even though I'm not a monarchist, (laughs) Kingdom did that just on a kind of poetic level. Yeah. No, it was incredible because I do feel like there is a rising movement, if you will, of patients like you and I, where we're like, no, you know, we don't have to live in in darkness or in silence and by ourselves dealing with this on our own there's so many of us let's band together and it is like a kingdom it is like an empire so I totally get it and I definitely appreciate it you know Megan you go into great detail uh I appreciate so much about this odyssey to a diagnosis I mean it was not I have to say, I was diagnosed within six weeks. So my period yeah. of suffering and uncertainty to a diagnosis was very short. And yeah. I know that I'm so lucky in that way, but that was not the case for you. Yeah. So, yeah. What, so two things. The first is for those who don't know, what are your confirmed diagnoses? And it must have been so difficult for you to relive some of the worst days of your years of your life. Yeah. Look, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, that's a great question. So the first question is, um, I have suspected basically what the very first diagnosis I got was a diagnosis of autoimmune thyroiditis, which took me down the path of really thinking about autoimmune disease as a kind of systemic disease that often um, went missed among especially younger women who have it. Um, so I was became very interested in that sort of the world of autoimmune disease, the fact that autoimmune diseases were rising. But even after I got treated for that, I just kept having a whole constellation of symptoms that was not explained by the diagnosis. And so for, you know, it took more than a decade to get even to that that first diagnosis, then a couple of years to get the remainder of the diagnoses. But in that time, I kept thinking, am I making things up? Am I, I mean, I knew I wasn't, but you know, am I hypersensitive? And that's why I have, you know, maybe everyone feels pain all the time, et cetera, et cetera. Cause I had very strange, very intense neurological pain. Mm-hmm. Um, eventually was diagnosed with suspected tick-borne illness that had not ever been caught and did have a CDC positive test for Bartonella eventually. So was treated for um, tick-borne illness and kind of immediately got a lot better but again, was left with this layer of symptoms, right? That were unexplained. So over time ended up with a diagnosis of um, hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a kind of hypermobility caused by a defect in some of your connective tissue, which makes your veins, it makes your cartilage, it makes all kinds of things in your body. So if your veins are a little too flexible, you know, you can imagine you have all kinds of problems. It's not just like you're very bendy, right? It's like everything's not quite working, right? And I have something called POTS, which is connected to that. Often people with HEDS or EDS have POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, a mouthful for those of you who don't know it. But it basically means your, your, your autonomic nervous system, it's basically a disorder of your nervous system that controls unconscious processes like blood going to your brain when you stand up. So I was fainting and getting concussions, you know, so as you can maybe hear in that, there's this cluster of diagnoses, right? And there's this whole cluster of systemic problems that are affecting me in different ways. And I used to think of it as, I have so many different small problems. Why is this, right? Because on its own, fainting once or twice a year, not necessarily a life-changing event, though it can be if you hit your head. And I used to really worry about before, one reason I ended up writing the book was that I was asking myself the question, why is it that a person could end up with all of this stuff? Like, is it something about me? Naturally. What's going on, right? And that's where we go. We always think it's our fault. I know, right? And we can talk about that, but so much of the book (laughs) is about, I think the quest, the odyssey to understand this identity and, and to kind of shape it within other aspects of our identity, right? To sort of embrace our illness identity and then also figure out 
who we are with our illness and how that changes over time. Anyway, so yeah, it was really this kind of, and still is this ongoing because I just got COVID and now I have all these post COVID symptoms. So I was tweeting about it and all these people were like, oh, of course, someone with chronic illness thinks they have long COVID. I'm like, no. <laughs> and someone was like, you just want to star in your own story, right? So this is the kind of um, pushback that we get, especially I think from men as women. And I was like, honestly, if I were going to write my own story and star in it, it would not be. <laughs> Not in this one. <laughs> so I don't think anybody hopes for this. <laughs> so it's just very interesting though, right? How you become like so I became interested in a whole different variety of ways in how simply by virtue of being yourself with a collection of call it unlucky problems, you become suspect right? Mm -hmm. Your testimony becomes suspect. Your very existence seems to be a sign of something wrong with you mm -hmm. as, a, as a psychology, as a person, and your own, your, any, any uh, steps you take to try to understand it, remediate it, talk about it, narrativize it, becomes an example of your own fixation on your unwellness, where you should be performing wellness instead, right? So there's like a lot to unpack there, but that's one of the things that I try to talk about. And I think that's where the subtitle of the book, which is reimagining chronic illness really comes in, which is like the book is almost just the first step, mm -hmm. right? And then the reimagining comes from the work you're doing, the work others are doing to sort of talk about and name proactively these frameworks that get put on us so that we can say, no, you know, you want to believe that we're perfectly well people who are fixated on our sickness because it's really scary to look at the reality otherwise, right? Oh, but absolutely. the reality is not that, yeah. You, uh, you have this quote in your book that really resonated. Um, you said something along the lines of like measuring things that are hard to measure now. You were talking about COVID and how COVID sort of unlocked this interest and in taking a deeper dive into these invisible chronic illnesses. And now people were finding ways to measure things that are hard to measure because of COVID. And then, so that was towards the end, but then in the middle, you know, you talked a lot about the emotional trauma and stress that you were going through with, you know, sadly, I'm so sorry, your, your parent, your mom's passing, your dad was going through chemo, you, yeah. you know, at one point you were trying to have babies, like, these are all very, very stressful things. And yeah. I was so relieved to hear someone like you call this out. Because I know even from my own community that so many of us feel, if we look back, at our history with, with illness, that there was some kind of emotional stressor or trauma that happened kind of right before the onset. And I feel that a lot of people are in your, with your platform or following, feel nervous to say this out loud because it's like, is it the responsible thing to say? Am I acting like a doctor and blah, blah, blah. It's none of that. It's just being human and realizing that these emotional experiences that we have can sometimes lead to, you know, what happened to you and I. So I'd love to hear about, you know, why and how you decided to dive into the emotional stress that was happening all behind the scenes unrelated to your illness. Yeah, I think so many of us struggle with um, the kind of lived sense that stress, emotional or otherwise, can worsen our condition, right? So I sort of started from that place. It became really clear that though I didn't know what was going on, a lot of the time it felt like I had the flu. So I'd wake up and I would think I'm getting a cold. And then over time, I realized I never got the colds. I just felt like there was something inflammatory happening in my body. And what I began to notice was that it was often would happen when I had a really stressful week or I had to travel, right? Um, and so I think when I got the diagnosis and I was writing the book, I felt, I mean, I'm, I don't know, I'm just one of these people who have to look at everything. Like even if people don't want to look at it, I, especially if people don't want to look at it, I want to look at it. Um, and I wanted to explore that lived reality for me, which was that stress clearly played some role. At the same time, and I always like to be really clear about this, you know, I was really resentful of people who kept saying, well, you're very type A, you're very like high strung, like 
you're just stressed and that's the whole problem because it was very clear to me that was not the whole problem i know people who are far more stressed than i am they're not sick right Mm -hmm. but i also knew that my mom had died and whatever had already been going on which it had been just definitely got way worse and we can unpack that well one reason it got way worse was i was super run down and i got a very bad virus right after she died and i ended up with mono and then right everything gets worse but so like whatever it is clearly we're just these entangled creatures right i'm a poet as well as a journalist like i i experience life as an entanglement of body mind brain you know we, we know the brain is an organ that our emotions live in so the idea that somehow our emotional life is completely independent of um our, our immune system you know we just know is no longer true we know our nervous system and our immune system are entangled right why this is so hard to talk about, as you just got at, is that we live in a culture that loves to be reductive and very black and white in its thinking. And so as soon as those of us within the community try to explore that question of could emotional stress be a factor in illness, it gets oversimplified and reduced, right? And it sort of becomes a way for others to excuse themselves from having to think about the problem because the problem once again becomes us, like something's Mm -hmm. wrong, right? But we know from science that, um, you know, things like poverty, racism, um, early adverse childhood events shape future immune system activity. The presence of adverse childhood events raises your likelihood of autoimmune disease, right? have a little brain bug, so I can't remember, but it's something startling, like 70%. It's a startling statistic and I don't have it at my fingertips. So there's really no way as a journalist to look at that data and say, you know, nothing's going on here. And there's this great work by um, Arlene Geronimus talking about, she asked the question, why were so many um, uh, young black women dying in childbirth? Mm. She comes up with this idea of what she calls weathering, which is she shows that stressors like racism actually change your telomeres and your immune system right and so lead to more so so we have to talk about this and i think we're going to have to talk about it from within the community right because i think we're the ones who can be trusted with this this kind of storytelling it's funny you brought it up it's been on my mind because i got covid as i said this summer and i'm definitely dealing with some long covid stuff some of it exacerbation of pre-existing stuff so i'm in a flare But one of the things I've experienced, um, and I saw it in my kids too, was that I was just, you could tell that there was neuroinflammation and I was very anxious and I was uh, much more irritable than usual. Kind of like if you have a hangover, so not that I've had a hangover in a while, (laughs) but anyway, you know, but it's been, it's not something, so I talked a little publicly about the COVID, but it's, it's, Something as I've been reporting on long COVID, a lot of people are experiencing, but it's a very hard story to tell because as soon as you say, along with the other symptoms, are any sim- sort of mental symptoms of neuroinflammation, you're going to get right to the, oh, it's all in your head. Right? Exactly. But as you know from Susanna Cahillan, who I know you had as a meat author, like neuroinflammation can cause all kinds of, all you know, kinds. it doesn't have to be like, why do we always talk about the psychosomatic and not so much about the soma psychiatric, right? Like the body can be driving psychiatric symptoms, not just psychiatric symptoms driving bodily symptoms. Wow. That's deep. <laughs> <laughs> that's really deep. Um, not related to your book, but more about COVID. Did you lose any hair after COVID? Yes. I have very thick hair, so you can't notice. And I'm almost, yeah, but I'm, yes, I have definitely lost. I've heard that this is a thing. Some and no one talks about it. Right. I don't have alopecia. I just, my hair is thinned, but I know women who lost, who have actual alopecia, like it's an autoimmune process. They lose parts of their hair and they've had to go on, on drugs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got COVID for the first time in May don't recommend. I got it after two boosters and it was still awful. Thankfully I got Paxlovid right away and I was able to get that started and it helped, you know, eventually like three days later, but the real trauma for COVID for me, thankfully I didn't have long COVID symptoms is that I'm still losing my hair. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I used to have, now I can say it because I don't have it anymore, but like 
from May before May. Like I have like voluptuous jasmine yes. hair. I saw you with it. I think it yeah, it's, it. half of it is gone and it keeps falling. So I'm like, all right, is this just going to keep falling till I get bald? Like what's going to happen? You know, I'm nervous about that. I know. I think there are some treatments, um, but people are not talking about it. I think a child is going to visit me. <laughs> oh, hello, child. Who is this? This is Ronan, everyone. Hello. Hi, babe. Um, yeah. So some of the book is about trying to have kids and this is one of the results. <laughs> we can actually go right to that topic. So I love, love, first of all, I just love to see women crushing it, but also like a fellow Spoonie. I'm so proud of you. Um, oh, here's another one. This is, all this is Connor. This is Hi, Connor. Connor. Connor six. So listen, guys, Mama, we're going to go downstairs. I'm going to finish. Mama, I'm not going to see it. No, sir. Guys. <laughs> Super cute. Daddy's right. gonna take you. Excuse me. Okay, I'll be right there. Okay, and I'll come snuggle with you. Okay. Oh. So take you. I don't want to talk. Okay, and stop through to Connor if you stay. So you're gonna go with Daddy. He's gonna pick you up. I'll be down. Okay. Oh my gosh, so cute. So cute. They're so cute. Ask Daddy. Why don't you do a wordle with that? <laughs> I can't make that decision. I listen, you're not going to get it because you're interrupting, but you can go to a Wordle or a little Wildcats game. Goodbye. I will interrupt you go again. Oh, no. bribery. That's very clever, but What's that's not bribery. Bribery is when you make Okay, I'm going to go. I will see you in a few minutes. Connor, I'm in a call, okay? I'm so sorry. Okay. So cute. Hey, they're so uh, they're so adorable they um, figured out all the tactics so. <laughs> i'm sure you talk so much about um women and autoimmunity and i love that you talked about this because we don't talk another thing we don't talk about it enough i'm sure so many people who are watching this people who have what you have people who have what i have have been told by one person or the other, whether it's in the ED or wherever, that whatever's happening is a figment of your imagination, or it's a panic attack, or your anxiety is, you know, causing whatever. Yeah. This is so, so, so prevalent. And it's, I'm realizing it as I read your book, as I read Susanna's book and all these other female, you know, uh, spoonies, I guess, who are talking yeah. about it. Yeah. Tell me, like, I, I just want to hear more of your thoughts on that, because I think it's super important that we talk about it. On the women and autoimmune connection in particular. Yeah. And how we might be treated differently in these clinical settings because we're women. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, this idea of, um, or the phrase medical gaslighting has been trending lately. And I think it really does come out of the reality that I experience a lot of my book is about, you know, the, the part that's my story really tells the story of being sick. You know, I started getting sick when I was 21. I had just graduated from college and I would go to doctors and I would have pretty severe symptoms in some cases. And I looked, you know, relatively healthy. And because doctors um, can be so focused on weight and signs of like health around that, that they would always say, oh, you're slim and your cholesterol mm -hmm. looks really good. Actually, it was sort of unhealthily low. You know, mm. that was actually a sign. Um, and I got gaslit, right? I was told over and over, well, maybe you're just anxious. You have a high stress job. And part of what I write in the book is that, you know, in retrospect, that's actually incredibly puzzling to me because there was an enormous amount of autoimmune disease in my families on okay. both sides. We know that autoimmune diseases tend to affect young women. We know that they're hard to diagnose often as one researcher, the, actually the so-called father of autoimmune disease, mm -hmm. um, Noel Rose, who was at Johns Hopkins before he died. Um, he told me, he's like, look, sometimes the organ that's being attacked by the immune system in an autoimmune disease is like 80% gone by the time we can even measure that there's a problem by the time it looks like a problem on our test. So we, this is changing. We're starting to get much better tests, but you know, given all of that information, it would actually be scientific 
to look at young women and say, hmm, this person might have an autoimmune disease that I don't know how to, di that our diagnostics are not good enough to pick up yet. But instead we get this very unscientific emotional response, right? And the thing I always like to point out is that it's actually the doctors and the medical system that's unscientific and emotional, not the, not the patient, right? Um, and that response is, oh, this woman, it's all in their head. Um, and I, I see that in the book as a kind of legacy of the, um, uh, the epidemic of diagnosing hysteria in mm. the United States and the United Kingdom in young women in the 19th century, which really, when you trace the history, comes out of and erupts at a time when women are starting to get things like they're starting to fight for the vote, they're starting to want to work outside the home. And all of a sudden, they're told, oh, if you work too hard, you're going to have nerve problems. They're called hysteria. And then Freud comes along, and then that gets turned into a sign that, guess what? You're the last person to understand your symptoms, and the male doctor is the only one who can tell you what they really are, which is a problem with you, right? It's like, you just look at that history and it's so clear that how the medical system has treated women whose problems it can't solve is a response to the ways in which our, our diseases threaten their expertise, the ways in which um, misogyny still exists, the, all of that, right? And some of it quite unconscious, right? I don't think that, there's people out there thinking about Freud, you know, when they're, right. when, they're di when they're turning us, turning us away. But I do think that cultural history is still there. And, you know, the history of misogyny, the history of anti-women bias is still there. And on a much more practical, concrete level, we know that we have not studied female animals the same way that we have biologically male animals, right? So we just know far, far less about the biology of women um, than we do for men. Women. Yeah. I'm telling you, <laughs> the older I get, the more I'm like, we get everything, we deal with everything, and we get the least. How does it work? <laughs> I know, I know. We're I the know. least appreciated. <laughs> I know. And we do all the task multitasking and everything. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Women are like superhuman to me. They're it's, it, I'm so fascinated and amazed by women, the older I get. Yeah, no, it's completely true. And yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so much autoimmune diseases happen to us. Yeah. And so that's the mysterious thing. So something like 75% of people with autoimmune disease are, are women. Yeah. We're seeing a similar gender imbalance in long COVID, although it's not as extreme. And, you know, a question we always have to ask is women do tend to avail themselves of medical care more frequently and earlier in the course of a disease than men do. So there's a lot we don't know, I think, about men and long COVID, but when they try to just do blood analyses and look for irregularities, they are finding it more often in women. So there's something about women's immune systems function very, very differently from men. We have more estrogen. We have another X, um, you know, many of us have another, um, you know, from the doubled chromosome, which can mean for more genetic mutations. Um, you know, so there's a lot there that potential cause for, we again, just don't know enough about why this is happening. Well, people need to find out. <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> so, I, I, I like that you, your book isn't all bad, right? Like, it's not like, these are all the horrible things that happened to me. This is how, you know, science and medicine have failed chronic illness. No, there's a lot of hope in it too, which is great and inspiration. And I love that you focus a, a, a lot of your pages on healing. So as we read through your book, you know, we get a sense that there was a period of time in which your illness or your illnesses sometimes got in the way of your writing, especially in terms of pace and, and how yeah. quickly you used to be able to write yep. as opposed to not. Yep. It was clear that this was quite devastating for you, understandably. This is yeah. your craft. So when and how did you get your groove back? Because you have, since getting ill, written five books. Is that is that correct? Um, yeah, I guess I have. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's, 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 that's
I mean, you know, the funny thing about my story, and I think one reason that it's really was easy for me to doubt it, even was that I had almost like someone was describing this as almost, um, you know, if we have the idea of perimenopause, it was almost like para infection associated illness. I think basically I had an infection that I had. I probably got Lyme disease when I was 21. Right after I graduated from college, we rented a house one town away from old Lyme, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Three weeks later, my neurological symptoms start, I mean, three weeks later. And then I start going down hill, right? But it's, but for 10 years, it's kind of like one thing I really like to focus on, especially when I'm talking to people who are newly diagnosed is, you know, I, I, even when our bodies go wrong, there's a lot in our bodies that are resilient. And basically my body kind of coped with this devastating infection until my mom died, until right before wow. until she got sick. Um, which, you know, might be a coincidence, but you know, it's about 10 years later. So for about 10 years, it's like, I would have bouts of bad health and then I would sort of have an equilibrium. So I wrote a lot of books then, but then I had this period of about four very, very bad years, beginning when around right before my mom's death to about three years later, eventually I was treated with antibiotics, which tremendously helped me. And that's when I started this book in earnest. And one thing I tell people is, I would not have been able to write this book when I was at my sickest. You know, I I think I say in the book, I might have been able to write one of the pair, some of the sentences, Mm -hmm. but I wouldn't have been able to do that synthesizing work of putting them together. I wouldn't have been able to sit with you and quite so energetically talk. I I would have been here. Um, It's funny, I rewatched a video of me with interviewing a very famous poet. I talk about it in the book. She later said to me, wow, you know, when I first met you, I thought you were just very, very shy and kind of Mm. withdrawn. And I watched it the other day out of curiosity and it was incredibly painful because I do, I talk very quietly and I, I'm there, but I'm not there. You know, I remember the day I felt really sick that day and you can't see it, but I just seem like a different person. Right. So the this book really comes after that. It comes from a period where I have bad days. I am not always well, but I'm, I've got, you know, the hacks and the medications and the doctors now to, you know, most of the time be somewhat functional, pretty functional. Um, And to feel like that inner flame that I think of as whoever I am is, is there, which was missing for a while. So Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, I think, um, I think part of it too, really, to be honest, was feeling like I had to share the story. I know that could sound hokey, but I I really felt that. I just thought if there's anything I can do to help others not go through what I went through, I have to do it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you, 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 um, yeah, you you went into so much detail, which I it was sometimes even painful for me to read because I'm like I I know exactly what she's talking about, right? Yeah. Like, but I think it's important for people who don't have chronic illness to read those difficult mm-hmm. words and experiences because hopefully it opens their eyes up to like what sometimes invisible illnesses can actually be doing on the inside. Yeah. I tried to have a few jokes. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's like, you know, I, I, it's not a funny book, but I, I really do. And it's not a book, I think, of false hope. I really wanted to resist the, and then I took antibiotics and everything got better and it's okay. And you can. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because that puts a burden on all of us when we don't get better, right? But I did want to show that, you know, there is hope and there are people fighting for the cause and there are ways in which I think knowledge and understanding and community make the experience so much better. Um, and I really did, you know, I, 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 I'm not better the way I once hoped I would be, but I'm better some days in the way that lets me function and do what I love, have kids and be a mom. So, you know, I think that's a really challenging thing for those of us with chronic illness, as we come together to tell stories, it's like, how do we tell the stories of our, of our condition? Because they're not all gloom. I mean, there is a lot of gloom, right? But there's many people with chronic illnesses who have periods of remission and periods of, you know, just getting through the days and humor and fun with their friends in some way. So I I wanted 
I don't know, I feel like often in the media, chronically ill people are represented in these very, very particular ways. So true. Right. And I wanted to sort of show that we shouldn't be othered. We're still humans who want all the human stuff. You know? So true. So, so, so yeah. true. Yeah. So to our live audience, um, we're going to open up to Q&A. And while people are submitting questions, um, I have a, a question for you. One yeah. more. Um, <laughs> Who was your primary audience in mind when you were writing this? Were you writing this for fellow patients? Were you writing this for future doctors? Were you writing it for the general public? Everybody, like who did you, who were you writing this for? Yeah, I think one reason the book took me, I'm embarrassed to say, I think almost nine years, something like that, was that I really was trying to write it for a lot of different people. So first and foremost, obviously people living with similar conditions, those were first and foremost, my, the people I was speaking to. I just wanted to be, I don't know, I didn't have any friends who were like me at the time. I didn't really have some of the kind of connections I've made now to others. So I felt quite alone. So I wanted that, here's someone who's going to talk to you about what it's like and share some of the kind of intimate and like, you know, I'm not like totally excited to show, share everything. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like I fight with my husband, or mm-hmm. whatever. But I really also wanted it for family members and loved ones and friends because I found that when I wrote things down and shared it with my friends, they understood what I was going through so much more mm-hmm. than if I tried to just talk to them. So I had this mm-hmm. idea that, and then absolutely also to medical healthcare workers and clinicians because they're part of this too. And I think they're in a system that doesn't serve them. So the book is critical of the healthcare system, but I think ultimately, I hope sort of supportive of medicine's need for reform for the sake of medical workers as well as us. Love, love, love it. Okay. We have a live question. I'll read it to you, Megan. Uh, My young daughter has various things wrong with many parts of her body, eye problems, skin problems, GI, gynecological, and more. She lives in Nashville. I don't. I suspect that there is an autoimmune issue underlying all. She's seeing specialists at Vanderbilt, but I'd like to find an additional person who could look at the whole. I've Googled Vanderbilt Med Center under Integrative Medicine, Holistic, etc., also Nashville at large, all that comes up is chiropractors, et cetera. How can I go about helping her find such a practitioner? Is there such a practitioner? Yeah, it's such a, this is the fundamental problem is that how do we get access to, um, yeah, this more integrative approach in a way that feels like we can trust it because often with integrative doctors, you're paying out of pocket, right? Yeah. So, there's a lot of, there's a lot at stake. Yeah. And because of that, also a lot of them have the, you know, the business model is to attract a lot of patients. And so it's hard to tell who's going to be really helpful from who's not, who's responsible. I will say, um, I recently uh, had an experience with Parsley Health, which is, you can join, I think they're based in New York, but they have people all around. It's uh, virtual and remote. I don't know if they serve people in Nashville. So they take some insurance now and they do bring a functional approach. And I've been very impressed with their, what they offer. And it's all vetted because it's a centralized um, health system, basically. And I know they're, I think they're working with Aetna now. So oh, great. Yeah. And they're working on having more. So it's expensive as most of these places are, but um they've let me sort of see how they work and sort of walked me through how they're how they would treat me and it's it's been very impressive and I would say it feels very vetted otherwise I use word of mouth right like I would go on social media and find you know kind of groups that seem like they're full of people who are like-minded and sort of try to get answers and see you know what name comes up a lot um yeah right? And sometimes there are advocacy groups. I mean, you might go through something like the Autoimmune Association mm-hmm. website and see, do they have recommendations in your area? You might give them a call and say, how would they go about finding someone? You know, I do think the thing that's challenging is autoimmune disease. There often is that kind of microbiome, dietary, nutritional component where you can identify foods causing triggers and not all standard conventional medical doctors, even rheumatologists will go down that path. And so I think there's a lot of resources online. It's digging through and and finding them through some, some groups and maybe the autoimmune association could, 
Okay. That's yeah. good advice. Oh, this is a good one. Now that you have a better handle on your diagnosis, do you feel you have your condition and symptoms satisfactorily managed or at least under acceptable control? How is daily life going for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think if you asked me in June, I would have said pretty good. <laughs> you know, um, I had really gotten to a place where unless I got a virus, which for me is always a trigger of a lot of autoimmune activity and a lot of, a lot of inflammation, I was doing pretty well. Like I would have, I was at about 80, 85%, about 85% of the time. So I could have a really bad day. Funny things trigger stuff like a low, you know, like a storm coming through. Mm -hmm. like, I don't know if you ever read Agatha Christie novels, but there's like always these, you know, older British ladies who will be like, I can tell a storm is coming by mm -hmm. the twinge in my knee. And I feel a little like that. <laughs> Me too. Right. But um, I was doing great. And then I got COVID and um, two weeks ago, I thought I might have to take medical leave from my job because it's been so up and down. Um, so I'm, you know, have great team and they're really helping me and I'm taking various things and on a new medication for my POTS and in particular, my POTS have gotten very out of control after, after COVID. So yeah, yeah it's like, I went from 85% to when I was like in July, I was at like 30% and I'm slowly rehabbing, but I can't exercise anymore. I can't, um, I am slow. I can now get back to doing about like five minutes on a bicycle and keep my heart rate, you know, not dangerously high. So it's a slow, long climb. But that said, I do feel like the previous problems that were there are still managed. It's just that I added a new. A new yeah. Problem. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. It's never just one thing. And, you know, I don't know how you feel about this, but I have more strategies in place to function to manage and it's actually one of those is the understanding that when stuff happens you I have to stop and rest and I fought that for so long and now I I I have embraced or come to understand the loss of control mm. it's still painful um it doesn't feel good but I know to accept it a little bit faster, you know? Yeah. I don't know that I'm there yet. <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying I'm good. You should have seen me. This. I mean, you, you know, I'm still doing, I'm not good, but I, some part of me understands that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's good. It's good for me to hear that actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cause everyone in my life will tell me that I, you need to slow down. You need I to know, I know. Well, and do you feel this to me? I mean, I am so part of me is like, look, I don't know how much good time I have. You know? Exactly. I just don't know. You know, I mean, and the COVID thing is an example of that. It's like another thing could come from, and I'm just like, you know what? I'm, I've got my mind right now. I just want to use it. <laughs> I'm a hundred percent with you. I support you. Okay. <laughs> Hey, here, maybe enabling, but that's okay. No, same. Yeah. Now that you've been on your health odyssey for 10 plus years, what would you go back and tell your 21 year old self to do differently? What would you advise all your doctors in those early years of misdiagnosis to do differently? Great question. I love that question. <laughs> I wish I could go back in time. I know. Um, I would say, believe yourself. I mean, the number one thing I would say is just believe yourself, believe your intuitions. I, I doubted myself so much and I let it go on so much longer than I needed to. I would also say, move on from the doctors who are helping you. You know, I get this question all the time, like, how, did you, how can I help my doctor understand? And I think uh, if the doctor is not really listening and helping from the get-go, I've just come to think you're not, there's really nothing you're going to be able to do. There's so much energy you could spend. We can spend sort of trying to communicate, trying to fix things, but you know, at the end of the day, that's not where our energy should be going. So I've come to just be very like, you move on as soon as you feel you're not, get, you know, and then that said, you may have a doctor with whom you do have a connection and relationship and it's not always there or they kind of poo-poo some things or not every conversation is perfect. I'm not suggesting we be, 
you know, dismissive of those doctors, but I'm saying we all know those doctors who just kind of aren't listening and are totally. So yeah, I think we, we have to, and in terms of what I would tell the doctors, this is something I've been thinking about a lot because it's come up with long COVID. There's doctors out there saying, you know, I don't really believe long COVID is real because I see these people and then they just stop coming to see me. So clearly they're getting better. Right. Well, actually, <laughs> those people probably just stopped seeing you because you're not helping. So I did realize that I never went back to my doctors and said, mm. hey, I missed this, right? Maybe they've read the book. <laughs> okay. really. But um, I do think one thing we have to think about collectively is how do we teach doctors, you know, not in a malicious way, but kind of go back and say, look, this is what's since happened because I interviewed almost a hundred people um, we're living with diagnoses and for my book and something like 92 of them had been told they probably had a psychiatric problem or they were hypochondriacs within 18 months or two years of their getting a really concrete um, organic diagnosis of something that was non-psychiatric, right? So I, just, I mean, it was just overwhelmingly, that was what was going on, you know? Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know. You did a brilliant job of connecting the dots between research, treatment, and clinical care. How do you see a post viral institute coming together that becomes an epicenter for patient care? Hmm, that's a great question. I think we need, I always like to say maybe it's a post infectious institute or an infection associated institute because obviously I have tick-borne illness that's bacterial I have lingering symptoms from it so I like to bring bring Lyme and tick-borne and bacteria back in there but we obviously need um, the creation of a national you know infection associated illness center and we need many uh, infection associated or we could call them post-viral centers we don't always know if the it's really post, right? In some cases, the virus is persistent. So I think what the first step is, is, is finding and identifying those people who've been doing work on conditions like ME-CFS and Lyme who are doing really good science and really good clinical care and making sure that, that their knowledge is not lost. Um, and as we've heard earlier today, we all need a way to access good care and know we're accessing good care. So I, that's another reason these centers are important. Um, clearly such a center is gonna have to bring together people with expertise in many different kinds of fields. Medicine is very siloed. We need much more comprehensive care. I think such a center needs to address the challenges of living with such an illness, which pose employment challenges, which pose mental health challenges, right? I mean, separate from totally. these, right? Just the, the anxiety and depression that can come with loss of control. I think we need to I think they help to be places that lead the way in telling a new kind of story about these illnesses um, and creating community, honestly, for patients. And primarily, finally, um, not primarily, but crucially, um, including patients, including patients' knowledge, right? Um, rather than shutting us out, listening to us, um, listening to what we know, or, and also certainly our questions. Because I often think, in my experience, going to doctors for 20 years, what they were able to talk to me about often had nothing to do with what my most pressing questions about getting, managing my life were, mm -hmm. right? that makes sense. Totally. There's so much more to say. I'm getting tired. Oh, yeah. Great answer, but yes. No, no, no. That was a great <laughs> answer. So we have two questions left. So what has your experience been with patient advocacy groups along your journey? What has been helpful to you? And where do you feel patient advocacy needs to improve slash innovate? That's such a good question. I could like, I would love to uh, talk about that for a longer time when I'm also more fresh. Um, I guess I can see two things. One is that temperamentally, I am kind of an introvert who is a skeptic, mm -hmm. right? And so um, joining, like this is separate from advocacy groups, but just to go back in time, joining patient groups online was 
challenging for me because it's not sort of not what I, it's not just how I operate in the world. Yeah. I never liked, you know, I was always the kid who like, I never liked doing exercises in theater class, like anything where we all yeah. are, I just, it wasn't who I was, right? Right. Um, that said, I think patient advocacy groups and also social media groups where patients can find community are absolutely crucial to these contested chronic illnesses, foundations like your, I mean, structured places where we can get access to information, friendship, community is so, so, so important. Advocacy is so important because as we know, these diseases are not being taken seriously. Um, so I think the big question I sometimes have around advocacy, especially as people engage on pl in platforms like Twitter or social media, is the question of there is a form of advocacy historically that's antagonistic, right? And quite, um, you know, think of some of AIDS activism. It was, you know, it had to be antagonistic. It had mm -hmm. to be to make change. Sometimes the antagonism is directed at people that I think are trying to help, right? And and so I think that's always the challenge when 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 advocacy has to be maybe antagonistic isn't quite the word, but when it has to be fierce right? It has to say, this is the need. Mm -hmm. You know, we just want to think about where we're directing that and who the, the potential allies are that we're, you know, we we're, we're have appropriate quibbles with, but maybe sometimes the, we're also frustrated, the tone becomes the same across the board. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? So I think really identifying, um, you know, what the goals are and who the potential allies are that we have kind of quibbles with versus the like real targets of um, change and agency. I would love to see, you know, and, and this is, I think patient advocacy groups are trying to do this, but I do think the medical system needs to start to listen to patients and make space in large academic medical centers to bring patients in and listen to them. And I know the NIH is doing some of that with long COVID, but they got to make sure it's not lip service, right? Yeah. Got to make sure it's not performative. It's got to be real. Right. Yeah. You are speaking my language. I feel like I'm preaching this every day. You know, it, it, people say they want to incorporate the patient voice and this and that, but it's really just become a buzzword for most people. Really? And they know they have to say it. So they say right. it. so the like, right thing to say, but are they really doing it? Are they putting their money where their mouth is? I'm so glad you said that. I think we all needed to hear that again. Um, my last question for you. Yeah. What is next for Megan? <laughs> I don't know. I'm um I'm writing another book slowly that um what can I say about it? It it deals with the legacy of what I have realized over time was a kind of interpersonal trauma, right? Um with with a you know, um, a romantic partner and a sort of sexual, a moment of sexual violence, uh, content warning. Um, and it's really about, um, so it sort of takes, and he died during the pandemic, so not of COVID. So it's a longer project, I think, about memory and legacy. And um, again, it's sort of about storytelling, right? Like, what story do you tell about these really complicated moments or really complicated people in your lives who do something bad right um wow so so that's a sort of long-term project I don't know it's it's a challenging book so I'm, it's take it's going to take whatever time it takes to write but I'm continuing to think about and write about chronic illness and um in particular long COVID and I don't know thinking a lot about how we use story to become visible mm-hmm yeah. Totally. Yeah. I don't know if I ever told you this, Megan, but so I started the foundation two months after I got sick. I was just, I just turned 25 oh and I didn't know what to do because everything on the internet said I was going to die oh. and there was no known therapies. There was no cure. They had no idea why it happened. It was just a disaster. Oh. Like, the, yeah, awful. And you know, I looked online and just, it, it was horrible, but basically I realized after sharing my story and what had happened to me on my blog, 
that there was so much interest in from people who weren't even affected by disease to learn more about what had happened to me. And that's what gave me the another idea about the foundation, because I was like, what if I create a platform where people with this disease can share their stories and we can share them from around the world? And that was the very first program. It's called Voices of NMO. It's also now Voices of MOG. And we've shared about 140 stories from all over the world, patient stories, caregivers, clinicians, researchers, infusion nurses, and like- it's just, it, I have to say, we do a lot of really cool stuff, but that's my favorite. And it's the first program and it's the longest standing. And it's like, why we love talking to people like you and why what you have done is so incredible. Like you're touching millions of lives by sharing your story. Thank you. That means a lot. Thank you. I appreciate Great. that. Thank you for all you do and the storytelling. On, yeah, it's amazing. Thank yeah. you. So for everyone out there, this is The Invisible Kingdom by Megan here. Um, it's an amazing book. I love it so much. I subscribe to your unpublished, unwritten book already. Um, and I and I, I wish know. you... I would... should say finally that I am thinking of starting a newsletter. I probably will be free for now. Yeah. So stay tuned on social media for that. Yeah, absolutely. We'll put all of your social handles um, on the YouTube page and Facebook channel. But Megan, thank you for being oh, here. Thank you so much for having me. Ooh. Oh, thank you for having me. Oh, I don't know what happened to my video. Did that was there? No worries. No <laughs> worries. Oh, wait, someone wanted to say, not a question, but wanted to say the moment before you said, believe yourself. I was thinking that on my adrenaline insufficiency forum, when a new member asks, what they need to know, the very first thing I tell them is believe in yourself and know that you are not making this crap up. Amen. What a way to end. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Everyone have a good night. Bye, Megan. We love you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye.